So Glynn turned to me and he said, it's the anniversary of the storming of the Bastille. I thought of you to preach. Now I like France. I like certain words that go with France, like revolution, guillotine, <laughs> coquille Saint-Jacques, lovely food. My French isn't up to doing much of a sermon, I'm afraid, not in French. I remember doing the oration at a school speech day when I was about 12 and having to learn words I had no idea of their meaning to speak to this, the high master of St. Paul's school, who is very important. I find I've still got it inside me. I could do that now, <laughs> but perhaps not. Our gospel reading that we've just heard tells us that we find our authority and our life as Samaritans not in what we say, but in what we do. And the agenda for our doing, for us who dare to stand so proudly and impertinently strutting our stuff here in the center of the city, cheek by jowl with our neighbors, our agenda, the Good Samaritan tells us, is people. Those who sleep out in the domain. Those who live in tower block apartments with decks overlooking the sea. Those who wander the streets looking for a porch that's warm enough to sleep in. The transsexual prostitutes up on the K Road. The newborn babies in the hospital. The gamblers in the casino who can't leave the tables even to go to the toilet, whom as a city we are prepared to sacrifice all too easily to the god of greed and money with more and more pokey machines, gaming tables and shattered lives. The Good Samaritan's clear. We are here for a purpose a gospel purpose, to stand beside these people and to proclaim another way. And not just to proclaim it, but also to challenge and live the simple, difficult, God-given, impossible life of Christ. Anything else we are challenged to see is a travesty of the love of God. We can, as a community, settle for easy answers if we want to like the simplistic biblical fundamentalism that seems attractive these days, that demands that we deny intellect in the cause of comfortable, self-congratulating, naive conformity. Or there's the warm cotton wool Christianity, made up of little more than hymns and anthems, stained glass windows, and that pietistic glow in the pit of our stomachs or the desperate attempts to cling to those old-fashioned values that get muddled up for gospel truth and seek to keep the status quo safe and secure. How easy it is to mistake the old-fashioned for the eternal. I want to take this moment of the Good Samaritan to look at the tools that we have, because he had them. He had denarii in his pocket. He could do things. The tools we have in our pocket to enable us to live the gospel, to face the questions that people pose for us and to us. What makes us tick? As we look at St. Matthew's next chapter in its life, as we prepare to bid Glynn farewell, when we have to choose what sort of a church we want to be, <coughs> what is becoming a creative, progressive, prophetic Christian community all about? What have we got to help us and challenge us on our journey as St. Matthews? A few things. First of all, we have the Christian tradition. 
2,000 years of the Christian church's history struggling to express and live the faith that is in us. We find this tradition in scripture, in history, in our creeds and liturgies, in our buildings and music, in the lives of the saints, and in the stories our grannies and granddads told us. And part of that tradition is also us, our history, our story, ordinary people, Bill and Brenda, people in every century struggling with God and each other over the washing up. Us, ordinary people, praying and telling our stories. We are as much part of that same dynamic yearning as were those, as were those early Christians. Same, some saints, some martyrs, some Samaritans, some just ordinary 4th century, 19th century, 21st century men and women. So when we look at issues of war and peace, justice and injustice, love and sexuality, family and community, taxation and community care, the Treaty of Waitangi and inclusiveness, we have a great resource here. 2,000 years of a great resource. And much more than 2,000 years. We are part of that much larger tradition that contains the strivings and the vision of people of many faiths. This common searching after God, told in so many languages and dialects and cultures and dreams, be they Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, or the many other religious traditions that fill our world and our striving. So the first tool we have is our history. History of generations of people attempting to walk with God and trying to talk about his journey, her journey, as honestly as possible. It's messy and it's chaotic and it's troublesome and there are many contradictions in the many truths that make up our tradition along the way. The second tool we have, our second resource, is the world around us. Make no mistake, God speaks through the world, through science and politics and sociology and psychology and anthropology and all the other ologies. Through the desire for peace and the work of people of peace and integrity, through the good Samaritans in every age, active for God, without really having or needing much of a handle on God, where love and generosity and empathy and openness in the end are enough, people who without synods and dogmas still search for justice, who through art and poetry, drama and literature keep the questions and the passion alive. I often, I often find a much deeper grasp of theology and theological questions expressed in secular poetry, in novels, in drama, far more than in theological lectures or even sermons. If we are frightened of a real engagement with the world's struggles, we will miss an enormous quantity of God's many truths available for us if we're not too blind or scared to see. But it too is full of contradictions, full of disagreement, full of debate and argument and rows. This third resource I'm glad we've got is here and now, because it's us. This community, this band of friends. God is revealed in the story of this place and in the stories that we bring to this place and live out here, in each other's praying or lack of praying, in our successes and failures, our hurts and joys, in the hard work of being us, of 
of being church. This is how it is. We might wish it otherwise. We may have nothing in common other than our desire to be church, but that's how it is. As we are called to be church, to make church, to be Christ, to make Christ, here is the hard work of being us, of being community. Hard work in the face of each other's idiosyncrasies and peculiarities and frustrating foibles. And finally, our fourth resource is us as individuals. If we look as honestly as we can at how we are and what we are actually doing as feeling, hurting, hoping, loving individuals, then I believe that we can create, can identify the agenda we have as individuals for our journey. This too is full of unease and difficulty and contradiction. I believe that it is in the debate and conflict, the argument and the struggle, the delight and the moments of togetherness that fill our traditions, our world, our community and ourselves, that we are able to discover the reason we're here. Not the acceptable reasons that we kid ourselves about, the respectable Sunday reasons of disciples, but the hidden, heady reasons of needy, difficult, glorious friends. This is where I believe St. Matthew's gets created moment by moment, often in secret, often nervously, whereas timid Samaritans, pulling our donkey behind us, we offer each other care. We bind up each other's wounds. We share each other's food and take each other seriously as unique, wonderful, transforming images of God in Christ and in each other. Just look around you now. It's here. Amen.